Next, on Unsolved Mysteries. Four robbers break into an armored car facility and take more than money. A sultry young actress is found severed in two. It's the notorious case of the Black Dahlia. Drug smugglers create an ingenious scheme 30 feet below the ground. Two families discovered their homes are built on a graveyard, and they are frightened to death. Five cases with strange clues and bizarre twists, and secrets that you would never expect. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. Vallejo, California. Two eleven in progress. It was an armed robbery, called in from the Loomis Armored Car Company. Loomis driver said they pulled up the store and see a subject tied on the floor, possibly subject inside. Patrol cars immediately rolled to the scene of what they believed was a robbery in progress at Loomis headquarters. As police made their approach, they saw that the security door of the main building was partially open. The officers moved cautiously, fearful that gunmen might still be inside, waiting. Inside, police discovered that this was more than just a simple robbery. Just beyond the door, a security guard lay dead. His hands were bound with rope, and he had been shot through the head. A bag of money lay near the entrance. In another part of the building, police found two other guards. One was dead, the other mortally wounded. Like the first victim, they had each been bound and shot in the head. The guards were identified as 49-year-old Martin McCumber, 29-year-old Dennis Jacobson, and 25-year-old Alfonso Lantoya. McCumber left behind a wife and children. Lanteo was engaged to be married in six months. It was just a brutal and senseless crime. As police began to investigate, they were surprised by the amount of physical evidence left behind by the killers, evidence that they hoped would help solve the case. Immediately after police units secured the crime scene, detectives were called in. Their first piece of evidence, an eight-inch blue steel 357 Magnum. The revolver had been reported stolen two years before. Inside the fenced compound, investigators found an orange duffel bag stuffed with hundreds of thousands of dollars. And nearby, they found the bolt cutters, which had been used to break in through the wire fence. As they searched along the fence line of the Loomis compound, detectives found gloves, ski masks, and another enormous sack of cash. In a park across the street, investigators found another pair of gloves, a ski mask, and an AK-47 assault rifle. Nearby where this AK-47 was found, we found an impression in the ground. This impression leads us to believe that the responsible laid in that area for some time following the crime, hoping that the police would leave and he could finish his escape. Judging from the evidence, authorities concluded that there were four robbers. Hair samples found on the ski masks indicated that at least one was white and one was black. 
Exactly one week to the hour after the murders, authorities set up a roadblock near the armored car company. They were hoping to find people who traveled the area regularly. They learned that a white man was seen running north from the building at around 9 that night. At the same time, a black male was seen running north on a different street. Working backwards, authorities began to piece together what happened on the night of the murders. Here's what they came up with. At approximately 8 p.m., four heavily armed men dressed in combat fatigues approached the Loomis building. One security guard was on duty inside. Forty minutes later, two other guards arrived, transporting a large amount of cash. Once the truck arrived and the gate began to open, it would have been possible for the murderers to enter the facility, coming in underneath the opening gate quickly before the guards had a chance to respond. Could have held the guards as hostages, ordering the guard to exit the turret room, which he may have done, thinking that that would save the lives of his friends. Once all three of these guards were overpowered, they were then bound. There was no reason to kill them, other than if, for some reason, they could possibly identify the robbers. When a gunshot was fired, they activated an interior alarm, which caused them to panic and flee. They filled the bags so full of money that they could not carry them. They were not aware of how heavy money actually is. Despite the blaring alarm, the killers fled and got away scot-free. The irony is, they got away with no money. Update. After three years, four suspects were arrested for the killing of the Loomis guards. While in prison on unrelated charges, Thomas Young confessed to the murders and named three accomplices. Eugene Livingston, a former Loomis employee, had assisted in the break-in. He confessed to the robbery, but denied participating in the murder. Livingston served three years and was released. Assad Muhammad denied everything, but six years later, DNA evidence linked him to the crime. The fourth suspect was released for lack of evidence. Next, a Florida criminal successfully robs 30 banks, but why do the police call him Fumbles? And later, the exotic mystery of the Black Dahlia murder. Anywhere across the state of Florida, you might meet the bank robber known as Fumbles. Besides the cap and gloves, he has a very distinctive trademark. He was given the nickname early on of Fumbles because in the first robbery, when he came in, he got inside the bank, drew the weapon, held it in his hand, and proceeded to trip and fall. Here he is again. Watch his mask. The police admit to a certain amount of amusement at their adversary's clumsiness. 30 armed robberies, however, are no laughing matter. Update. Fumbles has been captured. Within minutes of our broadcast, the police department in Clearwater, Florida, received a call from one of our viewers. He recognized Fumbles as Ross James Preston, a 23-year-old student living in Clearwater. A reason why you may have done it? When he was arrested, Clearwater authorities said Preston was so scared that he suggested that they let him jump out of a window. Do you like the name Fumbles? Is that Fumbles pleaded guilty to a total of seven counts of bank robbery and weapons charges. He served 13 years in prison 
and has since been released. Hollywood, California. The city where dreams die hard. She was known as the Black Dahlia. She had jet black hair and preferred black dresses and lingerie. Those who knew her best said she had a tattoo of an exotic flower on her inner thigh. She wanted desperately to be an actress, but her fame would not come from the movies. It would come from her death, a murder which has gone unsolved for 60 years. On a cold morning in January 1947, the nude, mutilated body of 22-year-old Elizabeth Short was discovered in a vacant lot in the Lee Mert Park area of Los Angeles. What made the murder so unique was the barbaric nature of the crime. The Black Dahlia's body had been neatly severed in half, gutted, and drained of blood. Her face had been very brutally cut from ear to ear in a grin. Her throat had been cut, and she had been mutilated sexually. Basically, she was uh, the worst case of um, a sex crime in the history of Los Angeles County. It's a case that has fascinated crime writers for generations, and almost every one of them has a different theory about the killer. Author Lawrence Sherb has studied every angle of the Black Dahlia case, and now he believes he knows the real identity of the man who so brutally murdered Elizabeth Short. I just didn't have room for dessert. Well, that's OK. You know, now we can have dessert someplace else. <laughs> Her life was as sad as it was brief. Like so many other young women, Elizabeth Short had been lured to Hollywood with dreams of becoming a star. Her career was going nowhere, and she was running out of cash. According to some, Elizabeth eventually drifted into prostitution. Can you take me home? Yes, I will. I need to ride all the way to Los Angeles. Can you take me to Los Angeles? Yes. Oh, great, thank you. Her final days were shrouded in mystery. Elizabeth seemed to be constantly on the move and was last seen leaving a diner in San Diego with a man who has never been positively identified. She called him Red when she spoke to him in the diner, and he did have reddish-colored hair. However, the police were never able to positively identify him, although some people felt that he might have been Robert Manley. Robert Manley was a hardware salesman who dated Elizabeth. Police brought him in for questioning, but he was cleared of the crime. Other men who were involved with Elizabeth were also interrogated. But each, like Manley, had an airtight alibi. The authorities were completely stumped. Then, a mysterious package was mailed to a local newspaper, a package from the killer. Here's Dolly's belongings, letter to follow. Inside the envelope, they found Elizabeth Short's address book, which was in reality her trick book. One of the pages in that book was missing, and it is undoubtedly true that upon that page was the name of the man who actually had killed her. The package was the closest anyone ever got to the Black Dahlia's killer. Then Lawrence Sherb began to research the case and made a remarkable connection. The case had many of the same features as the torso slayings in Cleveland. That sensational crime spree was the case that baffled Elliot Ness, the head of the famed crime-fighting team the untouchables. Not at this time. That's enough questions. The victim's been identified. Mr. Ness, they found the body here late this morning. The arms and legs have been cut off. Between 1934 and 1938, no less than 13 mutilated bodies were discovered in the Kingsbury Run District and surrounding areas of Cleveland. The victims were all prostitutes or drifters. The killer had dismembered most of the bodies with surgical precision just like the Black Dahlia case nine years later. Many people believe that Ness actually knew the Slayer's identity, but never had enough evidence to prove it in court. His biographer, Oscar Fraley, says that Ness was approached by a member of Cleveland's high society. And this lady, socialite, who was working with him, came to him and said, a member of one of our influential families fits your profile. So uh, Elliot said, 
That's fine. Let's meet him. This man admitted that he had been to medical school. Hello. Thanks for coming. So Elliot thought surely he had the guy. Have you ever been to Kingsbury Run after sunset? No. Ness said he gave the man two lie detector tests, and both times the suspect failed. Have you ever paid for the services of a prostitute? No. Soon after he took the polygraphs, the suspect voluntarily committed himself to a mental hospital. Around that same time, the torso slayings in Cleveland abruptly stopped. Ness believed that this would be the end of the case because the suspect was so deranged that he would probably remain in a mental institution for the rest of his life. But a few months later, a letter arrived from California. What's up, George? It's a letter from Los Angeles, and it's from the butcher, Elliot. In that letter, the torso killer describes the fact that he has left Cleveland and has come to California, as he described it, sunny California, and is now performing medical experiments upon his guinea pig victims here in Los Angeles. In the letter, the killer referred to himself as a DC, a doctor of chiropractic. He said, quote, I felt bad about operating on those people, but science must advance. The letter is just the beginning of the torso slayer Black Dahlia connection. The killer apparently had a fetish or cleanliness and cleaned the Dahlia's body very carefully with water, washed it very carefully, shampooed her hair, and scrubbed her with a bristle brush so severely that he left bristles embedded in her skin. The Cleveland victims also indicate that there were attempts to clean bodies. A butcher knife was used to bisect the Dahlia, and a butcher knife was used to dismember, decapitate, and bisect victims in Cleveland. Police determined that Elizabeth had been tortured for several hours before being killed. We know that she had been tied up. She had rope burns on her neck, arms, and legs. In Cleveland, several victims had exactly the same type of marks. Also, the Dahlia's body had been arranged in a sexually suggestive position just like the Torso Slayer's victims. But if the Torso Slayer was locked away in an Ohio hospital, how could the murders have continued in other parts of the Midwest and later Los Angeles? Perhaps one crucial point was overlooked by Elliot Ness when the killer entered the hospital. Sorry I was late, sweetheart. But we can leave now. Come along. If one is voluntarily in a mental hospital, you are free to legally walk out any time you want. And I think that's exactly what he did. I think he used the mental health system most of his career. When things got tough or investigations heated up, he simply checked himself into a mental institution, waited until they cooled down, and then checked himself out again and departed and continued killing. Elliot Ness never publicly identified the suspect. He took the name with him to the grave. He was the most prolific mass murderer in the history of the United States. And to this day, his true identity remains unknown. Next, drug smugglers come up with a foolproof scheme which has baffled authorities. And later, the real-life ghost story behind the legendary horror film Poltergeist. We are about to take you inside one of the most elaborate drug running operations ever discovered. It was a pathway for some 50,000 pounds of cocaine to enter the United States undetected. Douglas, Arizona. It's a sleepy border town 97 miles south of Phoenix. Just across the border is the Mexican town of Agua Prieta. This border crossing is watched closely by law enforcement. The Douglas Agua Prieta area is one of the main conduits for uh, cocaine coming into the United States. And for that reason, it's known as the uh, Cocaine Alley. A Mexican national named Rafael Camarena began to cross the border daily from Agua Prieta into Douglas. Camarena had purchased a concrete mixing company in Douglas, and he was working very hard to make a go of his new business. 
When I have spoken to Mr. Comrana, he, he had told me that he planned to be here for a number of years. He would check in on the business uh, once or twice a day. He spent a lot of time in Mexico, I assume, pursuing contracts over in our Prieta. Uh, but yes, he was an on-hands type of business owner. He uh, could have opened up a business anywhere in the United States of America. Camarena constructed a large warehouse in Douglas. At the same time, just across the border, he built a four-bedroom ranch-style home. The home, located in a wealthy area of Agua Prieta, had all the amenities that come with success. Mr. Camarena seemed to be a good husband and a good father. He's the type of person that, that you would want to be as your friend. In reality, Camarena's entire life was nothing but a devious facade, created to cover up a very lucrative and very illegal enterprise. U.S. Customs officials received information that Camarena was smuggling drugs from his home in Agua Prieta across the border to his warehouse in Douglas. Incredibly, Camarena's business was located just one block away from the U.S. Customs headquarters. Early 1990, we initiated 24-hour uh, surveillance of the Douglas Ready Mix company. I think we've got something. Agents staked out Camarena's business for over two months. Yes, Camarena, all right. They became suspicious of a truck that arrived and departed from the new warehouse nearly every day. On one occasion, we followed the tractor-trailer rig from Douglas uh, Ready Mix to a rural area outside of Phoenix, Arizona. A special task force of U.S. Customs agents and other law enforcement agencies raided a farm where Camarena's truck had been seen. Agents seized over a ton of nearly pure cocaine. The cocaine had been transported inside a hidden compartment beneath the truck's bed. The raid confirmed that the drugs had come from Camarena's warehouse, but the agents were baffled. How had Camarena managed to smuggle drugs into his warehouse? It was being watched around the clock by federal agents just a block away. We began receiving bits and pieces of information from a variety of sources. Uh, concerning a, the existence of a tunnel in the Douglas area. Two days later, agents from the United States and Mexico launched simultaneous raids on Camarena's warehouse in Douglas and his new home in Agua Prieta. Mexican authorities arrested two men who claimed to be gardeners. Camarena and his family fled. There was no visible evidence of a tunnel. At the Douglas warehouse, U.S. agents at first found nothing. Then they came upon a large floor drain. All right, I think we got something here. Let's get the crate off. We found about a five and a half diameter shaft that went 30 feet into the ground. And at the bottom of the shaft, we found the tunnel itself. This is the actual tunnel through which enormous amounts of cocaine were smuggled. When authorities uncovered the tunnel's entrance beneath Camarena's home, it became clear that this was no ordinary drug smuggling operation. It was something right out of a James Bond movie. Hydraulic pedestals lifted the pool table in a two-ton section of concrete floor to expose the entrance. Huge amounts of drugs could be stored below until they were ready to be moved across the border. The drugs were transported on a specially designed cart. At the Douglas end, a custom-made hoist lifted the illegal cargo into the warehouse. Workers packed the cocaine bricks into the false bottom of the truck. The contraband was driven out, right under the noses of U.S. Customs agents.
In my 18 years uh, with the Customs Service, this is one of the most amazing investigations I've ever encountered. The sophistication of the, um, of the smugglers, the, the, the construction of this tunnel itself, just demonstrates to what extremes uh, these organizations will go to. Update. 10 years after the tunnel was discovered, U.S. Customs agents determined that Rafael Camarena was already in a Mexican prison. He had been sentenced to 10 years under a fictitious name for a different drug charge. After completing that sentence, he was extradited to the U.S. where he pled guilty of smuggling cocaine across the border. He was sentenced to another 10 years in prison. Next, a man uncovers a coffin in his backyard, and soon he and his neighbors are victims of the Black Hope curse. Just outside of Houston, Texas, is a neighborhood filled with upscale homes and manicured lawns. Sam and Judith Haney settled in at the far western edge of the development. When we bought the house in Newport, it was the house that we had always been looking for. So it, it was the house that we intended to stay at for a long period of time. But there was a morbid secret about the Haney's perfect home, one that would soon turn their lives into a never-ending nightmare. It all began when a mysterious stranger showed up at their door with an ominous warning. Yes? This elderly man told me that he had noticed that we were putting a swimming pool in our backyard and that um, there was something about our backyard that I needed to know about. So I followed him around to my backyard. He pointed at the ground and said that there are some graves right here. Two graves. And he marked a spot on the ground where they were. I really didn't know how to react to that. I didn't know if he was just joking. I couldn't understand why anybody would want to joke about something like that. I don't want to get involved. Using a backhoe, Sam Haney decided to see if the man's alarming claims were true. Ben, stop! Hold it, hold it! I think I see something. And at that point, hey. we stopped with the backhoe. We and we got down into the hole and continued digging by hand. There was pine boards. When we lifted up the first board, we could see the indentation of a skeleton form. It didn't take long to figure out that it was an actual human remains. Sam immediately called the sheriff and the county coroner who conducted an official exhumation. Most of the bones had turned to powder, but 25 fragments were found, some so brittle they had disintegrated when touched. A second coffin, located alongside the first, hadn't been disturbed. Inside, two wedding rings were discovered on the frail index finger of the exposed skeleton. They handed me the rings, and it was sickening to think that I had desecrated somebody's um, grave. Horrified me. Wanting desperately to do the right thing, the Haney's decided to find out whose remains were buried in their backyard. The search led them to a longtime resident named Jasper Norton. Years earlier, Norton had dug several graves in the area. He told the Haney's that their home and a dozen others were built on top of an old African-American cemetery called Black Hope. The deceased were mainly former slaves. The last burial was in 1939, and as many as 60 people were interred there in paupers' graves. The people had very little money. They marked their graves however they could, uh, with markings on trees, with little stones, with uh, fences around them like a family plot. 
The two people buried in the Haney's backyard were Betty and Charlie Thomas. This picture of Betty is the only known photograph of either one. They died during the 1930s, and their graves were eventually forgotten. It was up to me to give them the dignity that they deserved, and that was very important to me. Judith and Sam Haney made an extraordinary decision. They reburied Betty and Charlie in their yard and prayed their spirits would rest in peace. I'm so sorry. But peace did not come to the Haney's. There was a clock in my bedroom, and one night it started sparking and putting out sort of a blue glow. When Judith checked the clock, she found that it was unplugged. That was only the beginning of the Haney's hell on earth. One evening, Sam went to work the night shift, leaving Judith alone. What you doing? I heard the sliding glass door open, and I heard which I thought was Sam saying, what you doing? Everything was quiet. The sliding glass doors were locked. And I thought, well, you know, you must be losing your mind. <laughs> this really must be getting to you. But much to my amazement, that's not where the story ended. In the morning, I awoke, went in my closet to get my red shoes, and I could not find them anywhere. So, of course, I started looking for them and went through all of her closets where she normally puts things. And we just couldn't find it. We had walked just a short distance where the grave sites were, and I could see something on the grave. And they were both side by side, like someone had just picked them up and carried them over and laid them down on the grave site. Even more disturbing to the Haney's was the realization that this was Betty Thomas's birthday. And I kind of got the feeling that it was like Charlie was giving Betty a birthday present. I began to come to the realization that this was not all in my mind and that this had to have some relationship to Betty and Charlie's graves being disturbed. Their spirits were saying, this isn't right. The Haney's were not alone. A dozen of their neighbors also reported unearthly sounds, lights turning on and off, ghostly apparitions. And now these bizarre events were becoming malicious. Like the Haney's, Ben and Jean Williams thought that they found their suburban paradise when they moved into the same neighborhood. And then after we moved in, everything changed. When I tried to plant new plants, they just would not live. No matter what I did, you know, fertilizer, whatever, I, they still did not, would not live. I constantly had a foreboding feeling, a feeling of things are not right or something bad is about to happen. The Williams said that near their flower bed, sinkholes appeared in the unmistakable shape of a coffin. The Williams would fill them in, only to have them reappear a few days later. The Williams felt their ideal home was invaded by a menacing presence. Random shadows slid along the walls. Whispered words and a putrid smell followed in their wake. <laughs> At the time, the Williams' granddaughter, Carly, lived with the couple. During the blazing heat of summer, Carly said she would stumble into bone-chilling pockets of ice-cold air. It would be very, very chilly and you'd have just this feeling of foreboding or just, you know, like either something wasn't right. Anywhere in the house, you would have a feeling that you were not alone, that somebody was watching you. It terrified me to be in the house by myself. The toilets used to flush on their own. As the water went down, I could hear, it was almost like conversations. Like I could hear people murmuring to themselves. 
it was a presence or spirit or something there, something that wanted to be heard, wanted me to know it was there. I absolutely believe that all of these things happened to us because we were on the graveyard and that we were simply going to be tormented until we left there. Next, the Williams report the hauntings in their home turned from horrifying to deadly. In a quiet Houston suburb, two families discovered that their homes had been built on an old cemetery. Well, they soon found themselves experiencing strange sounds and heart-stopping apparitions. The unexplained phenomena seemed to target the home of Ben and Jean Williams, both day and night. Ben and Jean debated what to do next. Now, me and Jean, we talked it over. And she said, well, what can we do, walk off and leave it? She said, we ain't got enough money to pay that on another home. I said, we always been fighters. We're going to stay right here, fight it, and we try to beat it. It wasn't long before Ben got his chance. I came home from work around 10 after 12 for midnight shift, and I walked straight to the kitchen, opened the refrigerator door. And that's when I seen these two ghostly figures. And they went straight backwards into the den. And then they started heading right down the hall to Jean's. And it was standing right about a foot and a half from the end of the bed. The only thing I really thought of, they ain't messing with my wife. As I dove through it, I felt a sticky, cold sensation in my body. Down the street from the Williams, the Haney's lives were also unraveling. I was crying all the time. I was frightened. I was scared of doing my daily routine in my own home. The Haney's decided to fight back in court. They sued the builder for not disclosing that their home was built over a cemetery, in part so that everyone would know what was happening at their subdivision. A jury awarded them $142,000 for mental anguish, but a devastating reversal ruled on legal grounds that the developers were not liable. The verdict was thrown out, and the Haney's ordered to pay $50,000 in court costs. And at that point, we decided to file bankruptcy. All in all, we ended up losing the case, losing the money, losing the house, we were exhausted, and we got in our car and went where there was love and support and tried to put it behind us. The Williams also explored legal recourse, but they say that they were told that without definitive proof of a cemetery on their property, nothing could be done. It was then that Jean made a decision that she will forever regret. That was the last straw. You want a body? I'll show you a body. So I thought to myself, I can dig, and I can dig about two feet a day, and I knew I would reach a body. But soon after she started digging, Jean oh. felt ill. I'm going to do the rest later. You can take over, OK? OK. Her daughter, Tina, volunteered to finish the job. She dug for almost half an hour. Ooh. Are you OK? Yeah, I feel just a little faint. I'm... I remember her saying that she was, that she felt funny. Um, she was getting dizzy as well. Here, she put the shovel down and she went back inside. Well. 
You lay down, honey. And she just laid down on the couch. Okay. She's like, Mom, Daddy, I don't feel right. You know, there's something wrong. We got to call 911. The last thing I remember her saying was, um, Mommy, take Daddy, care of my baby. Right. Take care of my baby. You're and she right. looked so scared. Talk to me, Tina. Almost immediately, her eyes started glazing She's over. And me. I was talking to her, She's trying to talk her out of dying. Please, Tina, talk to me. And all this time, her eyes were changing until they got to the point where I knew that she wasn't with me or she wasn't, you know, responding at all. Tina had suffered a massive heart attack. Two days later, she died. And I realized that I had desecrated another grave, and now I'm paying. I told Ben, I said, we have to get out of here. It doesn't matter what we lose, what we add. And I knew that if we didn't, that I was not going to make it because my fight was gone. I could fight no more forever. That's the trip. Fine. Great. The Williams escaped to Montana and later moved back to another house and another neighborhood in Texas. Today, they are a happily growing family, no longer plagued by mysterious noises, horrific apparitions, or heartbreaking tragedies. Back in their old neighborhood, none of the current residents have reported any paranormal activity. But no one has been able to explain what happened to the Williams or the Haney's. It remains an unsolved mystery. Thank <laughs> you.